chase and sinking of the Bismarck was without doubt one of the great sea epics of all time. And it was because of the changing fortunes of either side. But this great, vast, huge monster come out of its lair, and then in a flash it sinks the big British monster. It disappears, we look for it, we can't find it. A little tiny aeroplane suddenly finds it, reports where it is. Another little tiny aeroplane sends a torpedo which cripples it. It, it's extraordinary story. I mean, it's a, and it's full of heroism. Although the Battle of the Denmark Strait had been a great victory for Germany, the Bismarck hadn't come out unscathed. She had been hit in one of her fuel tanks and lost 2,000 tons of fuel. This forced the cancellation of Operation Rainbow, leaving Lugens with three main options. He could take the advice of Lindemann, the Bismarck's captain, to finish off the already damaged Prince of Wales, which was withdrawing towards the British home fleet that was advancing from Scataflow. He could then take the direct route to Norway via the Iceland Faroe Islands Gap. This was the riskiest option as it brought them closer to the British home fleet and opened them up to possible crippling battle damage from the Prince of Wales. Lugens decided not to take this option as it had been made clear to him by his superiors that his mission was commerce raiding and that he should avoid unnecessary battle if possible. The option with the least risk was to simply turn round and retrace his steps back to Norway through the Denmark Straits. This would give the widest berth possible to enemy forces coming from Skapa Flow, but it would have meant the failure of the mission, being back where they had started, having to run the gauntlet of the British blockade again at a future date. Nugent chose the third option of sticking to the original plan as close as possible by heading to the vast Atlantic Ocean. The Prince Eugen was undamaged and could continue raiding while the Bismarck could make her way to France for repair, then continue the mission, thus avoiding the North Sea blockade. The German fleet headed south at 24 knots shadowed at a distance by the Prince of Wales and two cruisers. At twenty past two in the afternoon, Bismarck briefly turned to engage the British fleet, which allowed the Prince Eugen to raise ahead and break free to continue her raiding mission. The Bismarck then headed for the French ports. By now, the Admiralty in London began to divert all available warships from their original missions in order to join the hunt for the Bismarck. The carrier Victorious surged ahead of the British home fleet to close the range so as to be able to launch a torpedo bomber attack. It took the Victorious seven hours to get within strike range, some 120 miles away from the Bismarck. Nine swordfish torpedo bombers took off and headed in the direction of the Bismarck. Three of these were equipped with the new ASV air-to-surface vessel detection radar sets. Even though it was midnight, there were still 50 minutes of daylight left when the eight planes proceeded to attack. One had lost contact with the squadron in the thick clouds and had to turn back. The German anti-aircraft fire was intense, and even the main and secondary batteries opened fire. One torpedo struck Bismarck's starboard side amidships on the main armour belt, which caused minor damage. The Bismarck reduced her speed to 16 knots for a while to carry out repairs. Every torpedo bomber landed safely back on the Victorious in the dark. All three of the British ships that were shadowing the Bismarck began to zigzag in case of possible U-boat attack. Shortly after three in the morning, taking advantage of the darkness, Lugens saw his opportunity to break contact with his pursuers. As the British turned to port, 
the Bismarck turned to starboard while increasing her speed to 27 knots. This temporarily widened the distance between them further than the 24-mile radar range of the pursuing ships. The Bismarck then turned almost a complete circle and set a new course for St. Nazier on the French coast. The British ships tried in vain to re-establish contact, but at four o'clock the Suffolk sent a report to the Admiralty. Enemy contact lost. Despite Lugens having broken free of his pursuers six hours ago, his onboard radio wave receiver was still picking up the radar pulses from the Suffolk, which convinced him that he was still being shadowed by the British. He therefore thought it wouldn't matter if he broke radio silence by sending a situation report back to headquarters. The Lugians had failed to understand the limitations of early radar technology. Beyond 24 miles, the radar waves reflecting off the Bismarck were too weak for the Suffolk to pick up. The British intercepted Lugian's signal, allowing them to triangulate her approximate position and obtain her heading via Enigma decoding. The RAF dispatched Catalina reconnaissance aircraft to search the likely route Bismarck would take to get back to the French ports. There have been more than 31 hours since contact with the Bismarck had been broken, when, at just after 10 in the morning of the 26th, a pilot, who officially did not exist, on board one of these Catalinas, spotted a dark shape down below. The Catalina was an American plane supplied to the British under the Lend-Lease program. It would be another seven months before Hitler would declare war on America, bringing them into the European conflict. So it was under strict secrecy that American service personnel were sent to Britain as instructors to train the RAF pilots on the use of these planes. As they went for a closer look, they came under withering anti-aircraft fire. This confirmed that they had finally found the Bismarck. As it would be impossible for a United States Navy pilot to find himself in combat with a neutral nation, the credit for the spotting of the Bismarck was given to RAF Flying Officer Dennis Briggs. The name Leonard Tucker Smith was temporarily erased from the history books. Unfortunately for the British, however, Admiral Tovey's ships were 125 miles away from the German battleship. They would never catch up with the Bismarck before she got to the safety of Luftwaffe bomber cover. Only the swordfish with Force H under the command of Vice Admiral Somerville, sailing from Gibraltar, could intercept Bismarck. Somerville detached the light cruiser Sheffield from Force H to forge ahead at flank speed and make contact with the Bismarck. At 10 to 3 on the afternoon of the 26th, 15 swordfish took off from the Ark Royal to attack the Bismarck. They had been flying for an hour when they obtained their radar contact and dived to attack. The ship sighted was actually the light cruiser Sheffield. Luckily for the British, the Sheffield was not hit by any of the 11 torpedoes launched at her because they had faulty magnetic detonators. Three of the 15 swordfish crash landed on the carrier due to the terrible weather conditions. The British put every effort on one last attack. It would be dark soon, and they knew this was their last chance to slow down the Bismarck. If they failed again, the Bismarck would reach the French coast in the morning. At quarter past seven, another 15 swordfish took off from the Ark Royal. This time, however, their torpedoes were fitted with contact detonators. 
The Swordfish Strike Force found the Bismarck at 10 to 9 and began the attack. Bismarck's anti aircraft battery opened fire immediately. None of the Swordfish were shot down, although several were hit. During the course of the attack, the Bismarck received two torpedo hits. One torpedo hit the armoured belt amidships, but caused only minor damage. The other struck on the starboard side near where the propeller shaft enters the hull. This jammed both rudders at 15 degrees to port. The Bismarck began to steer involuntarily northwest into the wind. The impact caused the flooding of the steering compartment as well as adjacent sections. This meant that all repair attempts had to be done underwater. Divers were ordered to enter the steering compartment in order to flee the rudder, but the severity of the damage made this an impossible task. It was far too dangerous to lower divers over the side of the ship to cut away the jammed rudder due to the stormy seas. The new erratic course of the Bismarck caused her to close range with her pursuing British fleet. Admiral Tovey decided not to engage the Bismarck at night due to the high chance of friendly fire with so many ships attacking from different directions. It would also give his destroyers a chance to launch a nighttime torpedo attack, which could further weaken the Bismarck prior to the gunnery duel in the morning. On board the Bismarck, the atmosphere was tense. Everyone knew it was only a matter of time before the British would engage them with overwhelming numbers. They were steering against the wind at seven knots with a slight list to port. It would be difficult for them to bring all their guns to bear on target with the ship being unmanoeuvrable. That night, Lugens made an announcement over the Tannoy. Soldiers of the Bismarck, we will fight to the last shell. Long live the Führer. And so the Bismarck and her crew's fate was sealed. She would go down in a blaze of glory. Throughout the night, five destroyers attacked the German battleship. These attacks were carried out in heavy seas with very low visibility. Time after time, the Bismarck would repel every attack with heavy and accurate fire from her secondary and main batteries. Despite a total of 16 torpedoes having been fired by the destroyer foot flotilla, not a single torpedo hit the Bismarck. As the sun made its appearance at 7.22 that morning, the crew of the Bismarck were exhausted. They had been at their battle stations throughout the night. The sun had been up for over an hour and Admiral Tovey on board his flagship, the King George, still hadn't had a sighting report. The weather was overcast and the morning mist was slowly starting to lift. Then, suddenly, a shadow emerged. Subscribe and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you don't miss the next video.